how does a tower crane driver yeah. get to sit down and, and do his or her work uh, with a, a tower crane that's two kilometers? I've not seen a tower crane with a lift on it, but by Jove, you need one here, right? Last month, it emerged that Saudi Arabia is working on a skyscraper that will rise two kilometers into the sky from its desert sands. If constructed, it would easily surpass the world's current tallest building, the rather puny 828 meter Burj Khalifa, and even double Saudi Arabia's previous world record attempt, the Jeddah Tower. Now, not much is really known about this project, other than it's being planned for the Saudi Arabian capital Riyadh, and that leading architecture firm Foster & Partners is designing it. There aren't even any renders yet. These are ones we made ourselves using AI. But it got the world talking, laughing and thinking about whether something this tall could ever really be built. And if so, how? Well, to try and find out, we got in touch with a leading engineering company. Can you make that core a little bit more efficient, take out some of the structure. Everything here gets concentrated, so it has a lot of stress here in the ground level, right? Now that is thicker than the Manhattan city block. Will it work for two kilometers? Would it work? Um, you know, that, that, those are questions to be asked. My name's Chris and I'm a building engineer. My name's Vini, I'm an architect. And today we're going to spend a little bit of time just looking at some of the challenges involved in designing a two kilometre tall skyscraper. We are very familiar when we walk one kilometre or two kilometres, but uh, when you add this in a vertical, we kind of get a little bit lost. So this is Manhattan, and uh, right here we have Central Park. So Central Park is around four kilometres in length. So a two kilometres building, it will be half of the length of Central Park. So this would be roughly the scale of this building in Manhattan. So if you can now find here in Paris State's building, Paris State is just a tick around here. So Freedom Tower is around there. Okay, so it's tall, we kind of knew that. But how much space does a building like that actually take up? We're going to use the example of uh, 432 Park Avenue in, uh, in, in New York City, which if you look at it, one of the first things you're going to notice, besides the fact that it's tall, is it's very slender. So what they've managed to do there is cram all of the important stuff into the building and keep it in a really sort of slender form, uh, which is quite a nice thing in terms of how you're going to build um, and hopefully delivering as much useful space in the building as they possibly can. So. 432 Park Avenue, that is 426 metres tall, so it is a tall building by any reasonable standard. Okay, it's tall and very, very slender. Now that's sitting in, in a New York City block. Now, a, a standard Manhattan block is 80 metres by 274 metres in kind of plan area for a, a block in Manhattan. Yes, let's just sketch here. We just have an idea about the proportion of the city block. So this is roughly the proportion, okay. and uh, if was this building and the city block of Manhattan will be approximately combined this footprint here. Yeah. Now let's scale that and see what it looks like if we look at a two kilometre version of this, disregarding all the laws of physics that might make it harder for us, okay? So moving from 426 metres high, changing that up so that we've got something that's two kilometres, that's going to mean we're going to end up with 133 metres worth of building. Now that is thicker than the Manhattan city block and it's still going to look impossibly tall and impossibly thin. So even if it's impossibly thin, the footprint of this building is going to be massive. But by shrinking the floor plan as much as possible, you create problems elsewhere. Let's think about it. 500 metres tall, towers. We know how to do it. We've done many. We find loads of examples everywhere. The whole challenge now yeah, comes when we start, no, we, when you stack them together. So everything here gets concentrated, so it has a lot of stress here in the ground level, right? Let's think about that. That's not just physical stress and, and engineers will immediately start to think about, well, hang on, how am I going to make this thing stand up? How do I deal with the weight of two kilometres worth of building coming down into the ground? But it's also all of the other impacts that the building's going to have on its environment. So thinking about 
how many people are going to be in this building and how they're all going to arrive. What about all of the deliveries they're going to need? You know, a building doesn't exist in isolation. You're going to have loads of deliveries every day, things coming in, waste coming out of the building, that's all got to go somewhere. We've got our example of our 133 metre building. This is uh, the size that we adopted in our sort of notional reference design for what this thing is, 133 metres. That's the outside. When you're looking at the building, that's what you're going to see. But of course, in the middle, we've got all of these other things now that we need to be able to deal with. When I'm building a building, when I'm thinking about trying to create space, I'm worried about what I can do here. Yeah, so this is where the good stuff is happening. And unfortunately, I need to build the core to make the building stand up, make it stack up, uh, but I want to make sure that's as small as possible. So this, I'm gonna call boring, but important, okay? When we start loading so many people through the building, when we've got so many demands on that space, what's gonna to tend to want to happen, my 100,000 people are gonna all want to pile into lifts in here, and I'm gonna to wanna to put lots more lifts in. The more lifts I put in, the more space the core is gonna take up. The more of that that happens, the less of the good stuff is going to exist. And therefore, you know, the whole purpose for building the, the, the building in the first place starts to become diminished. So it's all about the sort of economics, if you like. There's an important ratio that, uh, that, that people talk about, which is the, the net to gross ratio. And that's the sort of metric of how much of the building that you wanted to build is, is given over to all of this stuff in the middle. That stuff in the middle includes everything from the building's structural core to its plumbing, along with another important but overlooked feature. We're saying we've got this two kilometer tall building and we've got notionally 500 stories, halfway up that's 250. Let's just think about that for a moment, about my journey when I'm trying to get to my desk. So, uh, you know, person number one comes along and they want to um, get to their desk up here They've got the executive suite, level 450. When I get in the lift in the morning, I, I want to get in there and I want to go more or less straight to where I'm going because I've got, you know, I've got nigh on a two kilometre journey to do here. I don't want to be stopping every so often. It's like getting on a train and picking the stopper train versus the express, right? We've got this problem with lifts and you can throw lots and lots of lifts at the problem. You could take our sort of kind of square building because I can only really draw square boxes. And, and we can throw loads more lifts into here and make this bigger and bigger and bigger to try to move people around. But then we come back to this age old problem that there's less building there. So one thing we can do is we can use what we call a double deck lift. Okay, um, now, now these are quite neat. And you imagine this is, this is a ground floor, this is level one. I've got two lift cars literally welded together um, and, and you can fit twice as many people in that to do the same journey. Um, so that is going to reduce the number of, of, of lift shafts I need to move people around, particularly if I'm moving people in bulk, if I'm doing that express train kind of analogy. Now, we really can't go any further without acknowledging that designing a two kilometre skyscraper requires a serious grasp of some important core skills. That's where today's video sponsor Brilliant comes in. It offers thousands of lessons on subjects that are crucial to any budding engineer or architect. Best of all, it's fun, effective and free to start. Brilliant's huge range of subjects means you can take on something fundamental like geometry or something more applied like unlocking rental value on Airbnb. If you're interested in these subjects but were turned off at school by endless copying from textbooks, then Brilliant's visual style of learning is just the thing for you. Best of all, you can tailor it to your lifestyle by fitting in lessons with your morning coffee, in between activities or just before bed. Once you've found your routine, daily learning targets are a great way to keep you progressing. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, scan the QR code on screen or visit brilliant.org forward slash the B1M or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Now, let's get back to that enormous skyscraper. Okay, so double-decker elevators are one way of getting people around the building, but a skyscraper needs to be more solid the taller it gets to withstand all the forces that act on it. So how do ultra-tall skyscrapers avoid falling over? So we've got some examples here, I and mean, we've got the Jeddah Tower, which has got you know really quite an iconic, let's call it a propeller kind of shape to it. Now it's got this, this kind of form 
because it's a very, very strong structure to help it resist the extremely significant forces that are happening when you've got wind and, and there's building of a particular height. And this is going to help to resolve and, and deal with those forces that are going to want to make the building move and twist. So I think that's really, really interesting. But what tends to happen with these is that we've got elements of structure now, these kind of shear walls, which start to interrupt the space out onto the floor plate. So the use to which you can put that space that's outside of the core actually can sometimes start to be limited. Um, now that might work really, really well if you've got some uh, residential or hotel type uses in there. If you get those shear walls lined up with a notional grid that works for the space you're trying to create, fantastic. But it does give you, give you some kind of constraint in terms of how you might be wanting to use that space. If you look at back in time, like in the 70s, uh, the CN Tower has also a similar structural layout. You can see here from the core, the structural core and the buttress core. Yeah. So it goes, this is a very rigid structure that goes all the way up to support uh, the observation deck. I mean, I think probably the answer is that uh, mankind hasn't found a more efficient way of building something that's tall is going to be able to resist the forces that, uh, that are involved in, in a building of this height. Will it work for two kilometres? Will it work? Um, you know, that, that, those are questions to be asked. Wind is one of the biggest forces that act on a building, but it's not just the job of the core to stop it from falling over. We've got kind of two things going on. We've got that sort of self-weight, if you like, of two kilometres worth of building, and that, that is massive, when, and the structures and the foundations are going to need to be designed to, to deal with that. But then you've got this, this thing that isn't constant, and, and the wind, and some days there'll be next to no wind, and other days it's going to be really gusty and coming from different directions, and the building's still going to need to be able to respond to that and still be a nice place to be, even when you're two kilometres up in the air. So it, it, even if the wind isn't changing significantly with the, with the height, on a, on, a, on a strong windy day, if you've got a wind force acting down here and you've got the same wind force acting up here, because of the kind of lever effect, this is going to have a much greater impact on, on what the building's doing. Yeah. So now you imagine you've got this force which is being applied and then disapplied on and off, on and off. Um, that, that's starting to excite and make the building want to move. Here, the first one here, that, in the first sketch here, we have the tune, tune mass dumper. How does it work actually? Yeah, it, it is a pendulum action and, and it, basically what it's doing is a, a significant mass, you know, really, really heavy weight at the top of the building, which is designed so that it will move at a frequency that slows down the behaviour of the building and just damps it, you know, like suspension on a car, except this thing is sort of 80 tonnes or more of, 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 of sort of movable steel at the top of the building. I mean, I think the one in Taipei 101 is something like an 18 metre diameter uh, sphere. Um, so, you know, could be sort of 80 plus tons uh, sitting at the top of the building. There are other elements here that you can add to the design of the building to deal with the wind are such as like big openings. So this could do that, no, having these big openings in the facade of the building can actually help for the wind to flow across the building. Also the shape of the building plan can help with the wind. So uh, buildings with this square shape can not be very optimal for wind because you can create some vortex issues. Simple uh, details and you can, you can propose in the plan of the building, such as the one in Taipei, is to add some chamfers. So this, in this example here, it helps alleviating the whole wind pressure that hits the building. So that was a very good successful uh, detail on the building plan. There are other ways to keep something tall and thin upright. In fact, some innovative architects have even looked to bridges for inspiration. So um, Dubai Creek Tower is quite a good place to start in terms of um, you know, understanding a different proposal for how you might support something tall um, and whether there's any lessons we can learn from that. So that's um, 1.3 kilometres high um, proposal for an ob observation deck, which is you know a very long way up. Uh, but that um, it, it, there's not a lot else to that building, as far as I understand it. So you know you really have got something that is very very slim, and you're going to have to do something else to try to um, support and hold that hold that still. So what about using all that extra land around the base of the, the tower to try to um, try to restrain it, stop it from moving? Can you make that core? a little bit more efficient, take out some of the structure um, and give yourself some more space in our building. Would that be interesting? Very interesting. And another idea as well, maybe perhaps we could use even the cables. 
and uh, having the cable support in this tower, we could also uh, propose a kind of a cable car system to move people and also can, we can move goods. No, uh, doing this, we can potentially uh, reduce uh, the size of the core, uh, transferring some of the lifts, core functions along the cables of the, the structure. You're sort of taking a lot of pressure off that, you know, you we talked earlier on about this point yeah. right in the middle where everybody is coming together and having to, um, you know, use the building there and how that's working so hard in all kinds of ways. If you can start, um, you know, spreading out a little bit that load where people and goods and deliveries and things are happening, there's something really quite elegant about that. One thing to point out here is the technical definition of a skyscraper. The Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat specify that a tower must be more than 150 metres tall, no problem there, habitable across 50% of its height, sorry CN Tower, Tokyo Skytree and Dubai Creek Tower, and crucially freestanding. So any guy ropes or cables could threaten this structure's official status as the world's tallest building. Okay, so we know how to get people around this tower and how it might stand up, but what might a two kilometer skyscraper actually look like? Another way to improve the structural stability of this building, perhaps it could be an idea that we can sunk this building. Actually, you can create this lower ground level. So the building still like uh, with the two kilometers high, but actually you build the building below ground level so having these, you can, okay, keep the concept of the cables. You can create bridges across the building. So this can provide extra support for the buildings. So uh, with uh, like a transportation, a ground transportation passing through the site, this can become a connection to the, uh, you can create this transportation connection to the building. And uh, yeah, you can uh, find ways to capture rainwater on the base of the building as well create a landscape, microclimate, and also you know, uh, idea to, uh, to use the, the facade of the building to generate energy. Also the wind loads as well, we can have uh, like kind of ideas about wind power and generate energy. So, you know, I think we, we've approached this, this quite theoretical problem of how you would how you would design and deliver a, a two kilometer tall building. And, and you know, we don't know um, you know what the brief is, we don't know how the, the, the design team is approaching it, but we do know some of the challenges that they'll be facing in terms of trying to make a building like this stack up. So you know this is, this is sort of the, the Vinnie and Chris version of, of, of how you might make a, um, a building on this scale, uh, but maybe make it just that little bit more, um, tread that little bit more lightly on the planet. Now, if there's one thing we've learned over the years, it's never to write off a project, regardless of how crazy it sounds. But this really is in a league of its own. Building a skyscraper more than twice the height of the Burj Khalifa in the Saudi Arabian desert will test engineers, construction teams and architects to new limits. If you're on the project team and have just finished watching this video for some advice, you're welcome. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. You can learn more about that at the link below. Don't forget that we're inspiring the next generation of skyscraper designers through our investment into Brickborough, a fantastic Lego subscription service. You can learn more and get started today over at brickborough.com. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, or if you're an architect or engineer currently working on this tower and scratching your head, We'd advise you to subscribe to the B1M.